Israel are very much home from home in the States for me, so it's a pleasure to be here to share uh, the Word of God with you. And I'm just going to open in prayer, and then we'll turn to the Scriptures. Let's just pray together. Our Father, we come again into thy presence in the name of the Lord Jesus, and we're glad to be together in this way. We're glad, Father, to be able to take this time to share in our uh, communication of the truth of God, the Word of God, and also to listen uh, while it is brought to us by our brethren. And our Father, we thank Thee for our shared interests. We thank Thee for our common bond in Christ. And although we're separated by many miles, we thank Thee, Father, that we have this close bond as those who are in the family of God and those who serve the same Saviour. And Father, as we would seek to hear thy voice by thy spirit, we pray that we would have hearts that are soft and ears that are open, that we may hear thy word as coming from thyself and respond accordingly. We thank thee for the Saviour, we thank thee for our Lord Jesus and for all that he has done for us and all that he continues to do for us day by day. Our Father, we've come to love him and to know him just a little. And as we seek to love him more and know him more, we pray that uh, this exercise of thy people to convene a conference like this may be a benefit and a blessing to this end for every one of us. So help us, we ask, Father, as we're in thy presence, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you please to turn to First Samuel chapter 17. Uh, for a reading to a very familiar section of the Word of God, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And you're not very old before you have this story read to you or perhaps in a children's meeting even dramatized before you. And it's the story of David and Goliath. And we want to think about that um, and consider some of the truth that's contained within this Paddock within this chapter of 1 Samuel chapter 17. So we're going to read from verse 2 and we'll read some scattered verses through the chapter. It's a long chapter and I'm going to rely a little on your knowledge um, of the content of the chapter as well. Although I have to say that when I do read these chapters, sometimes uh, there's bits in it that I didn't realize was there and sometimes I'm looking for bits of children's stories that I find aren't there. So it's always good, isn't it, just to go back to what the scriptures actually say. So let's start in verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood in a mountain on the one side and Israel stood in a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. That just means he was over nine foot. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass upon his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, of Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now over, please, just to verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. But Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren 
And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And then just down the chapter, please, down to verse 32. As I say, we are skipping some of the narrative. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And so forth. Then right down to verse number 42. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with spear, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now that's our reading, and as I say, we, we will comment and take time just to consider the chapter, but that's the scattered reading I want to bring to you from it. Now, if you were um, a, a, a children's meeting, and you were all sitting waiting for me to ask questions and throw out sweets, then you might hear a different story than the narrative that I want to bring to you or the perspective of the narrative I want to bring to you today. You see, the idea very often given about David and Goliath is not actually the biblical concept that lies behind this narrative. Very often you will see books about facing your giants, conquering your fears. Well, of course, none of that really is what this story is all about. This story is not about what some people call therapeutic, moralistic deism. It is not about feeling good about yourself. It's not about boosting your self-esteem. In fact, it's the exact opposite. And this is a story that wants us to concentrate not so much on David, but upon David's God, upon the Word of God, and upon David's faith in God. And so we want to just look at this story and see what we can learn from it for ourselves today. First of all, as you go through the narrative, and I would recommend you read it fully, you find this, that we are introduced to an unlikely hero. David is an unlikely hero in this narrative. The background is, of course, that Israel and the Philistines are at war, and they are fighting over control, really, of the Valley of Elah, and Israel is on one side of the hill, and the Philistines stand across the hill, uh, across the valley on the other side. And instead of both armies engaging in combat, then a representative battle is suggested. And that was a common thing. In fact, it was common right up until maybe the 19th century. And each army would face off, and they would have a champion. And the champion would represent the army and go out and fight on behalf of the army. And so out comes Goliath. And he's nine foot nine tall, which means he's about, well, he's a good bit taller than me, let me just say that. He's a huge man and he's intimidating. He's an impressive specimen. He's massive. And out he comes and we read his challenge, which would also have been intimidating. And he stands as a mighty champion of the Philistines. 
Well, we also read what Israel's reaction to that great champion was. If you keep your eye on the chapter, for I'll refer to the verses as we go through. Look at verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now that word dismayed, it really just means broken, cracked. You see, Israel is defeated by the mere sight of this giant, of this champion. They haven't even fought and they are defeated and have lost the battle. Their spirit is broken before they go into conflict for God. Now that was a terrible thing actually because it demonstrated not just a lack of courage but it demonstrated a lack of faith. You see, when you go back in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy, and I have it marked here, so I'll just quote it to you. This is what God said to his ancient people in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seize horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. That was the promise that God gave to his people. Don't be intimidated by the enemy that you face. Go in the strength of God and in faith in God, trust his word, and the enemy is inconsequential. He can be nine foot tall or three foot tall. He can be one or he can be a multitude. He can come with horses and chariots and he can come with all the military power that men can, can muster. But look what happened to, to Pharaoh's mighty army when you were delivered out of Egypt. The greatest military might of the day were drowned in the sea by God and that is still your God. So when you face the foe, don't fixate on the foe, but rather concentrate on God, who is your God and trust him. That is, well, it should have been the way that the Israelites thought, but of course they didn't. And they're trembling. They're trembling because Goliath is a sinister and formidable foe. They are paralyzed, actually, not by the foe, but by their lack of faith in their God. Now, I'm going to stop as we go through here from time to time and make an application to our circumstances as the people of God in our day. And you'll understand that the applications that I'm going to make are taking what is a very physical narrative of a battle in Old Testament times and translating that into a New Testament context where we as the people of God are also engaged in conflict and her foes and enemies, which are spiritual. Now that doesn't mean that they're always unseen because there are manifestations of them all around us, but the power is not seen. And very often the spiritual energy is not seen and so forth, but it's a spiritual foe we face. But we're going to make the application. And here's the first one. Often when we are anxious and shaky and fearful of circumstances, it demonstrates this. It's not actually the circumstance that is causing the fear. It's our lack of faith. We've forgotten how great our God is. We've forgotten what God has done in the past. And because we forget and take our focus off God and, and put our focus on the foe, then we find ourselves shaking and trembling. And we raise the white flag because we're not thinking about God, we're thinking about the foe. We need to be people of the Bible. We need to be people of the word of God. We need to have God's promises saturating our mind. We need to be people who don't need to go and hunt and search out for the slightest encouragement from the word of God. It should be embedded in our minds. It should be calibrating our character and our ethos of life. And by the way, 
Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, TV, PlayStation, you name it. They all serve as a testimony to this. Well, they usually serve as a testimony to the fact that when you get older, you can't work half of them. But they also serve as a testimony to this, that time is not the issue. Time is not the issue. My generation and the one below it have more time than a previous generation. And it's demonstrated by the amount of screen time that we employ. Time's not the issue. It's not a lack of time or opportunity or even accessibility to God's word. That's more in our generation than in any time. But it's a desire to, to get to know God's word and to get to know it for ourselves. And so, well, it may have been ignorance in their part, who knows, but after all, this came after the time of the judges and everyone was doing what was right in their own mind and they weren't following God in the days of the judges and so it may well have been a time of ignorance. But what about Saul? What about Saul? I see you've just come on, Kyle, it's good to see you. Um, strange screen behind you, but you're really welcome. And um, We're in 1 Samuel 17 and we're thinking about David and Goliath and Saul had badly failed here, the king, in relation to the word of God. Now here's a wee word, or a little word, for those of us who are in positions of leadership amongst the Lord's people. Saul had failed in relation to the word of God. It was his job, when you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 18, those who led and ruled had to know and write out the first five books of the Old Testament. They had to get to know the law of God. And so Saul should have known, he certainly would have read Deuteronomy 20 verse 1 at some stage in his life. He should have known, but he was what James calls in the New Testament, a hearer of the word, but not a doer of the same. And he was a hypocrite. And he's representing God to the people, but he's not trusting God himself. He doesn't step out to face the champion. He's cowering in his tent as are all the rest of the army. Well, David, of course, is somewhat different. We're introduced to David in this chapter, aren't we? He knew God's word. He believed God and trusted him. When you come down to verse 32, if you just catch this, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. David isn't being a superhero soldier. David is simply being biblical. He is being faithful. He is doing what Deuteronomy 20 verse 1 says that they should have all done. And so David is not radical. David is not exceptional. David is actually doing the kind of thing that they should all have been doing. What he's doing is what they should all have done. He looks radical. But that's because of the disobedience of the rest of them, rather than his somehow excelling above them. You know, sometimes we read an awful lot of books about radical Christianity and dynamic Christianity and so forth. Actually, this is what I learned from scripture, that radical Christianity, dynamic Christianity is actually very simple. It's the one who gets to know the word of God believes and puts it into practice. That seems to be radical Christianity nowadays. It should be normal for us all. I mean, after all, don't we need more faithful, radical people uh, amongst our own assemblies, amongst the, the Lord's people in everyday mundane places? Radical Christianity. I, I think about David, you know, First time we see David, he's not going out with a sling and with a stone to face a giant. In this chapter, what we see is David and he's carrying cheese. He's carrying cheese. He's not fighting a giant. He's a young man marked by faith as he carries cheese up to the battle. It's a mundane, everyday, nondescript task that we see this young man engaged in. But this is a young man of faith. This is the sort of young man that God will use because he is 
faithful to God, whatever his circumstances are, carrying cheese. That almost sounds like the title of a book. And you get this idea of mundane service for God. God's going to use him in an exceptional way, but God will first use him in the mundane things of life. And so David comes up to the army and he's not looking for a giant to slay. He's looking for brothers to feed. That's what he's doing. But as he comes up, and again, I'm relying on your knowledge of the narrative here, he has what the rest of them didn't have. He has a spiritual perspective in life. Now, I love this about David. I love it in his language. You know, it comes out in the way he speaks about things, which is very different from the way the rest of them are speaking. So from a human perspective, let's just grab this. From a human perspective, Goliath is a formidable enemy. Saul and his soldiers, they are looking at Goliath from a purely human perspective. In fact, they say it in verse 25. The men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that has come up? That's it. But what they're saying is, listen, have you seen him? You know, if you see him, then you think as we think, if you see him. They were allowing the worldly, world-bound, earth-bound perspective on their situation to go unchallenged, to actually affect the way that they were responding. For he had said to them in verse 8, Am I not the Philistine, the Philistine, and you servants of Saul? So there's the narrative. That's Goliath's perspective. That's the world's perspective in the situation. And the, the people of Israel, the army of Israel, are not challenging it. They're adopting it. And they are reacting on the basis of Goliath's perspective and narrative. And so they are terrified. They're absolutely shaking in their sandals or shoes or whatever they're on. And they're there. And the reason is because the perspective is being driven by Goliath and not by the word of God. David arrives and he sees things completely differently. He's got a different perspective. Now his perspective doesn't just click on like a light bulb. His perspective has been crafted and shaped by experience with God and practiced faith out there in the isolated areas of the hills. That shapes him and prepares him for this public manifestation of faith. Now listen, some of you younger folk know this. That the private, isolated practice and proving of God in your school and in your college and in your home where you may be the only believer is the means by which God will shape you and develop you and grow you in your faith and in your walk with God. You cannot switch it on and off like that. It grows gradually, and it grows quietly. And that's what happened to David. And so he arrives. And, and you know, when he speaks about the circumstances, look at verse 26. David spake to the men. And he says, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. This is how he, looked, he views Goliath. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. Well, what did Goliath say? The Goliath, Goliath's narrative was, you're the servants of Saul. David's narrative is, we serve the living God. Goliath's narrative was, I am the Philistine. David's narrative is, you're an uncircumcised Philistine. Very different. One writer put it this way. There is David's spiritual perspective. Saul and the armies of Israel were afraid because they saw it as a conflict of their puny muscle against Goliath's mighty muscle. Of their little weapons against Goliath's impressive weapons. Of their experience in warfare against Goliath's experience. But David didn't see it like that. David saw it as a conflict between God and the forces of evil. 
Saul and his men saw Goliath and thought, he's so big we can never kill him. David saw the same man and said, he's so big I can't miss him. It was a different perspective. And so here he is, and he calls him uncircumcised, which is significant, because to be uncircumcised was to be outside of the Abrahamic covenant and the promised blessings of God. And when God instituted the sign of circumcision with Abraham, remember he was living in the land of Canaan, and the people of that land were morally corrupt, Sodom and Gomorrah at their zenith of their immoral ways, and God wants his covenant people to be morally pure and holy and set apart unto him and bear the sign of that upon their body. So he, and I'm not going to be crude about it, but he directs Abraham to remove the foreskin of the male as the sign of his covenant with him. So that they would have a very practical and graphic reminder of their required holiness and distinctiveness and separation from the moral condition of the people round about them as a result of their covenant relationship with God. And so David looks at, at Goliath and says, you're uncircumcised. You're not one of the separated covenant people of God. Doesn't matter how big you are. Doesn't matter how mighty you are. You are uncircumcised. And therefore, will be defeated. That's his confidence in God. Let me just make an application of this if I can. You and I have problems we face. And they seem like Goliath. Problems of relationships, problems of character, problems of the flesh, problems of employment, problems of difficulties within community, and they seem overwhelming. They seem too big, too strong. I wonder if you could change the perspective. You may not be able to change the problem, but you can change your perspective of that problem. For example, the problem of anger. The world calls it having a short fuse. When you read the word of God, being wrongfully angry towards one another is equivalent to murder. That's what the Bible says. So it's serious, it's significant, and needs to be treated as such. It's a different perspective. Adultery. The world says they're having a fling, or language like that, or an affair. Makes it sound adventurous exciting, makes it sound okay. The Bible calls it sin. The Bible does so and demonstrates the devastating effect of it on families and lives and the absolute corrupting effect upon those who engage in it. Different perspective. Homosexuality of one sort or any other of these sort of sexual deviations from the biblical truth. The world calls it being gay or an alternative lifestyle. The Bible calls it an abomination to God and sin. Different perspective. You see, the language matters. It expresses a perspective. We need to have the right perspective. Abortion. The Bible covers the atrocity of abortion for it's nothing less than genocide. The figures are absolutely appalling within our own nation here in the UK. Appalling. There has been no greater genocide in Europe since World War II. The Bible calls it, well, our world calls it termination or pro-choice. The Bible calls it murder and the shedding of innocent blood. Perspective, narrative, 
their language matters. It mattered to David, it matters to us. You see, this problem is not a Philistine champion, it's an uncircumcised Philistine. You see, our problems, they're not to be, they're not to be um, minimized and diminished by language. They are sin. They are offensive to the living God. I'm not just a servant of Saul. I'm a member of the army of the living God taking that narrative. I've been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. The battle is his. I serve the risen Lord. The language matters. Perspective is important. Well, what about the character of David's faith? Again, I'm depending on your, your knowledge of the narrative, and if not, then please read it fully after this. David's faith was not vague and surface and superficial. David's faith was specific and targeted and manifested in action. He didn't have faith in faith. You know, sometimes I think people have faith in faith. They say, I've got faith. Well, faith in who? Faith in what? Not just faith in faith. Some sort of nebulous, uh, generalized concept. David believed in the living God, who was the covenant-keeping God in direct relationship with his people, and it was a real thing to David to trust this God. He had faith in the Lord, who had stood with him in previous circumstances and would stand with him again. As Paul would say in Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, who pours his strength into me. And so David says in verse number 32, thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. David's faith was specific, was active, was aggressive, would cause him to go out and stand against the foe and not cower back in the tent. Secondly, David's faith was based also on his experience and knowledge of God. It wasn't the first test of faith that David had experienced. In fact, he refers to it in verse number 34. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. David is referring to past experience. He had proved God out in the wilderness. And so now he's going to prove God before the sight of an army. I think he only spoke here really to convince Saul to let him go. He wasn't boasting. He wasn't blowing himself up. He's attributing the victory to the Lord in whom he was consciously trusting. But I know this. David had proved this, that you can't let a lion and a bear in amongst the flock and leave them there. He had stood up not to live in peaceful coexistence with a lion and a bear. You, can, you can't live peacefully with a lion and a bear. That's why when you go to see them, there's a big cage in front of you at the zoo. You're not going to climb in there and pat them. And that's not going to be a, a pleasant outing for you. You see, you can't live peacefully coexisting against these wild animals. David knew it. They were a danger to his flock. They had to be faced and killed. So he does it. And just to take the kind of application, you and I cannot live peaceably with sin that would destroy us in our private life. And when we overcome those things, then maybe God will over use us to overcome a very public thing. But, you know, we can't tolerate and live peacefully and coexist with sin and the destructive manifestation of it in our own lives. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 29, if your right eye makes you stumble or fed you, take it and tear it out. You see, you need to deal harshly with private sin. And thirdly, his faith was in God alone. Well, he didn't trust Saul's uh, weaponry. No doubt it was wonderful, but he'd never proved it, you see. I don't think it was just that it didn't fit him. You know, it wasn't as if he was worried about it rattling about when he went out to battle. He'd never proved it. And so he's going to trust in God and not in the weapons. He's not going to trust in 
the means by which God would cause a victory, he would trust in God alone. I remember some of you are from Perth in Scotland. I remember um, listening to ministry in Perth a while ago by a brother who's now up in the Inverness area. And um, he was talking about Elijah by the brook Cherith. And he was talking about the ravens coming to feed him. And I loved this point that he made. His name's Douglas Mowat. And he made the point that it was just as well that Elijah didn't trust the ravens. But he trusted the God who sent the ravens. Because one day, the ravens never turned up. And if he had been trusting in the ravens, his faith would have failed. But he trusted in the God who sent the ravens. And here is David. And David's method manifests his evident trust in his God. You know, he's not magnifying the ability of a sling and a stone to take down a giant. You know, it's not as if he's you know, some sort of um, master of the sling to such an extent that this will do the job. And he is walking forward and his complete confidence is not as in his sling and not in his stone. His complete confidence is in his God. I can see him wandering down there and turning back and just checking that everyone's watching this. Because he does say that, oh, in verse 47, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. The battle is the Lord. It's as if David's saying, listen, watch this. I'm going to pick a stone out of this little brook and I'm going to put one of the stones into a sling. That's right, a sling. Are you watching this? A sling. And you go up against the giant and he's going to demonstrate the battle is the Lord's and his faith is in God. His faith is not in a stone or in a sling. There's nothing wrong with having good methods, and I think David would be handy with a sling. And it would be comfortable for him. And he would have practiced and practiced and practiced as a shepherd boy with that sling. And he will use what he's good at. There's no question about that. But that alone will not do the job. His trust is not in his sling. His trust is in his God. You know, God has given you and I abilities and gifts and so forth, and we might actually be quite good at it. But if our faith rests on the gifts and abilities God has given us, we're in for big trouble. Our faith needs to rest in God and in God alone. And so here he comes and his focus is on the glory of God. He's not looking to be a national hero. You know, his, he's looking for the exaltation of God amongst these people. And you can read this, and I finished the reading that um, when David speaks to Goliath, and it's quite, it's quite an exchange, isn't it? And David says to Goliath, listen, you're coming with a sword and a spear, this is verse 45, and my shield says, no, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. You defy God, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. And you can trace the study of the name and what that means, particularly in the Old Testament, and it signifies the character of God and the attributes of God. And David says, listen, I'm coming in the name of the God, the Lord of hosts, who has uh, resources that, that cannot be um, understood. They're so vast. And your army is just a puny thing in the face of, of my God. And the more you get to know David's God, then the smaller Goliath seems to stand. In fact, a full appreciation of the greatness of God makes Goliath look like a speck of dust and not a giant. And he says this, this day the Lord will deliver thee into mine hand. I will smite thee. And he describes what he's going to do to him. And he says this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He doesn't say that all the earth may know that David is a mighty warrior. Let's put it into a language. That all the, the, the community or all the assembly might know that I'm a mighty preacher. That all the assembly might know that I'm great evangelist one-to-one. Uh, -one. That all the assembly might know that I've got tremendous spiritual faith or whatever. No, no, no. David's not speaking about himself. He's talking about God. 
And he says, God is going to be honored and all the earth and all the assembly will know this. They will know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. The battle is the Lord and he will give you into our hands. Marvelous, isn't it? What a difference from Saul. You know, in chapter 15 and verse 12, 12, Saul wins a victory and the first thing he does is build a monument to himself. <laughs> so, so like the, the men and leaders of our world. So very different to the one that we follow, our blessed Saviour. Paul's, Saul's motivation, Saul's motivation is very different from David's and you see that in Saul's jealousy of David after this takes place. I'm going to finish with this. When you think about this idea of David and a picture of David facing foes, there's so much practical challenge that comes with that to us. The need for us to get to know our God not just so that we can fill our head with knowledge, but so that our perspective on life might be different. You face an illness. You face a trial. If you understand, and I understand, that we have a big God, then we will discover this, that what we face begins to diminish, begins to be put into perspective. If we have a little understanding of our God and very little knowledge of him, the problems we face will just grow and grow and grow and it'll be like standing before a giant. David himself was insignificant. David's methods were primitive. But the issue was not about David. The issue was not about David's methods. The issue was about David's trust in God. How much do we trust our God? It's a simple question. It's actually quite a serious question. How much do we trust God? Are we going to hide in the company of the faithless or are we going to step out with the loneliness of the faithful? David was by himself. The rest of them were behind him. David goes in the name of God to face the issues that lay before him that God might be glorified as a consequence. But here's my last point. What a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus we have here in the story of David and Goliath. I think ultimately that's the highest application that we can see in the story. David publicly states why he's going to slay the giant. All, all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. All the assembly may know that the Lord saves. You see, that's the primary message of this chapter. Not face your giants, it's that God saves. That's it. And what you can picture in here, it's a beautiful picture, I'll just mention it, is that God will save his people from a great foe. One that is too much for them but no match for God. God provides a substitute to represent his failed people. David is that champion. He is that substitute. He steps down into the valley himself alone. And he fights as one of them on their behalf. You see the picture? The Lord comes all the way down from heaven and he comes down for a battle which will be fought as man amongst men and he will, as a man 
can go into that battle. His true humanity beyond doubt. And where none of us could go, and where none of us could succeed, he goes, and he goes in my place, and he goes for me, and he goes as my substitute. And there, in the Old Testament context, David is Israel's representative, and he stands in their place, and he fights on their behalf, and he achieves their victory. And they haven't lifted a finger to bring about that victory for themselves. You know, when I think about the Lord Jesus, that's exactly what he did for me at the cross. He came all the way down. He came to earth and born and lived and died upon the cross. And the Bible says through death he has destroyed him that has the power of death. That is the devil. And then what has he done? What did David do? He brought liberty from the oppression of the Philistines. He delivered the kingdom back to the king when he comes back out of the valley and wins a bride for himself in so doing. What a beautiful picture of the Savior. Remember, he went into the valley of the shadow of death and into death itself and triumphed and came out of that valley just as David stood out with the head of Goliath. So too Christ came out of that scene of death and of victory and rose triumphant from the grave and ascended into heaven, taking captivity captive and giving gifts unto men. And through his sacrifice, he has delivered us who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. It's a beautiful picture of Christ, the son of David. David does what Christ, in picture form, what Christ would do in reality. And when David won, what happened? Well, the town's people rejoice. There's no more fear. There's no more shuffling their feet. There's no more apprehension because the foe has been defeated. And that is the confidence and joy and rejoicing that we as the Lord's people should share in and should declare. For we have Christ as our champion. He's the one who's won our victory, who's delivered us from our bondage. And he, of course, as we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, has delivered the kingdom back up to God. What a marvelous picture. Death is broken. Christ is alive. We are free and Satan is defeated. It's the story of David and Goliath. It's the story of Christ. And it's the story of our willingness, or otherwise, of being Christ-like. Going into face whatever spiritual fore remains for us. And knowing that wonderful victory that can come when we tr when trust, when our trust and faith is in the living God. I just trust that as we've thought about these things, and I'm finished now. But as we've thought about these things, it might be a real encouragement and challenge to us. And so next time, when you're reading the little uh, Bible story, most of you know, because I keep telling everyone that I've now got a grandson, I tell everyone. But you know, when we're reading the little Bible stories to our grandchildren or our children, or whether it's in the Sunday school, or whatever it is, and you come across the story of David and Goliath, let's not start thinking about moralistic uh, deism or anything like that let's think again about David's trust in God and let's think again about the lovely picture of our blessed saviour who won a greater fight and defeated a greater foe and has brought us into a greater freedom once and for all I trust that God would just bless this word thank you